Throughout the Old Testament, we learn much about the relationships of tribes, clans, and family groups. We began discussing Israel's family in the last episode, focusing on Joseph, the favored son, sold into Egypt, whose meteoric rise in Egyptian politics through the spiritual gift of interpreting dreams ultimately provided a land inheritance that would keep the family together. What can we learn in the last chapters of Genesis about spiritual gifts, brotherly love, and how understanding biblical narrative can make sacred stories more clear? We discuss that and much more on today's episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the public communication specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Hill is a research fellow at the Institute, and each week we'll be discussing the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints' Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block, so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today, we're joined by one of our research assistants, Rachel Madsen, an English teaching major here at BYU. After graduating, Rachel plans to teach in secondary schools and eventually obtain a graduate degree in educational leadership to work in school administration. Growing up around the world, one of the only constants in Rachel's life was the 1999 film rendition of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Donny Osmond. She has made it very clear to us that after watching the film over a hundred times, she has memorized the entire script verbatim, and thus is probably the single most qualified student to be speaking on the last few chapters of Genesis. Rachel, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Great to be here. (laughs) We are glad to have you here. Now, Christian, what's going on in Genesis chapters 42 through 50? Genesis chapter 42 through 45 contain the conclusion of the story of Joseph and his brothers. Famine is again the catalyst for a journey to Egypt. The brothers return home with food, but the resolution of the crisis of the famine produced another crisis. Simeon is held captive in Egypt until the brothers return with Benjamin. But Jacob is reluctant to send Benjamin to Egypt so that Simeon can be set free. When the brothers first arrive in Egypt, there is a moment of recognition. The narrator tells us that when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. The compelling drama that follows brings about the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams and ends in the final moment of recognition. The remainder of the chapters fulfill the same purpose as those end scenes in books or movies that tie up all the loose ends and explain how everything else plays out. In chapter 46, the narrative, once again told from Jacob or Israel's perspective, describes how he set out from the promised land to be reunited with his beloved son. God visits Jacob as he's about to leave the promised land and reassures him that his family will become a great nation in Egypt. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, God says, and I myself will also bring you back. The reconciliation of father and son is interrupted by the important task of reciting the genealogical lists, showing just how far the promises of Abraham have been fulfilled. Jacob's family size, 70 in number, ties in with the idea that 70 is a perfect number, suggesting that God's work was complete to this point. As the chapter closes, Jacob is finally and movingly reunited with his lost son. Joseph introduces Jacob to Pharaoh in chapter 47, and the house of Israel is given land to settle in Egypt. They are safe and secure, but separated from the promised land. Then the story turns to Joseph, describing how he administered the kingdom to feed the people and enrich Pharaoh. The impoverishing of Egypt and enriching of Pharaoh is either further testimony of how relentlessly things prosper under Joseph's care, or, if read typologically, a lovely image of how we need to give all that we have to Christ in order to be saved. Two chapters of blessings follow, prompted by Jacob's impending death. First, Jacob blesses Joseph's two sons with the covenant blessings of Abraham, adopting them into his family, once again preferring a younger to an elder son. Then Jacob blesses his sons, often enigmatically. These blessings and the parallel (coughs) blessings in Deuteronomy have been interpreted within the Jewish and Christian traditions for millennia. After bestowing his final blessings, Jacob asks to be buried with his kin in the land of Israel, a request Joseph fulfills in chapter 50. That chapter ends with the final reconciliation of the brothers and a description of Joseph growing old, dying, and being embalmed and entombed in Egypt. This is an unusual place to end the book of Genesis, perhaps. It is certainly the end of an era, the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by whose name the Lord would evermore be known. But the chosen people are once again exiled 
from the place that God prepared for them. But, like Adam and Eve before them, God is with them and preparing to guide them back home. That was lovely, Christian. I'm really interested in the idea that Joseph recognized his brothers, and that seems to be much more than, oh, hey, there are those guys who sold me into slavery. Is there something more that's going on here? Yeah, I think that this moment of recognition is a really fascinating experience and a fascinating element of this story. Recognition is called anagnoresis in literary studies, and it's, it's an important aspect of many dramatic tales, both in scripture and literature alike. This is the moment in which the lost hero returns and is finally recognized, as in the Odyssey, or when Jesus is finally recognized on the road to Emmaus. These are examples of one kind of anagnoresis, when a main character discovers the true identity of another character, with the result of the narrative arc radically changing. The other kind of anagnoresis is when a main character understands something about themselves. This was seen last week in the story of Judah and Tamar, at the moment when Judah understands that he is the father of Tamar's child. So, recognition often happens after the fact. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, warns the epistle to the Hebrews, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So sometimes we don't recognize the experiences we're happening until after that actually happens. It's only when thinking back that we realize that something profound has happened. This was the experience of the disciples, for example, on the road to Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us, they said, while he talked with us on the way, and while he opened up to us the scriptures. We may even entertain the Lord, and not be aware of his true identity, but it seems that the feeling of that moment will always remain. Yeah, it seems to me that these moments of anagnoresis come in moments of self-discovery, where someone is discovering something about themselves, or about themselves in relation to others. I see that happening in Genesis. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. This seems to be a theme which we've kind of noticed throughout the story of Genesis. And a particularly lovely moment is of, of self-discovery is that we saw right at the beginning of the book of, of Genesis in uh, Moses chapter 1, in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis, this kind of prelude where, where Moses realizes who he is. Thou art my son, God says to him. Although it appears that the kind of aha moment, the moment of recognition, doesn't really happen until Moses is confronted by Satan and says, I'm the son of God. He kind of realizes what that actually means. So when did this moment happen for Joseph? When did he realize what was happening with him? When, did it happen when he saw his dreams? When his father made him a long sleeve coat on the road to Egypt as a, as a slave in Potiphar's house? in the prison, or when he saw the dreams fulfilled and that revealed, or when he saw his dreams fulfilled and revealed his true identity to his brothers. We may not ever know when, but we certainly know that Joseph did realize who he was and what his role was in saving his father's household, and even that his brother's actions played a part in that role. At the very end of the story, when his brothers come to him, no longer benefiting from the protection of their father, they come and finally ask, as they suggest, prompted by their father, for his forgiveness. And Joseph tells them to have no fear. Have no fear. Although you intended me harm, God intended it for good, so as to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. So in these final words of Joseph's in the book of Genesis is revealed another great moment of recognition, and that is our own recognition that God intends it for good in our lives too. As Elder Holland recently taught on the BYU campus, God is perfectly and thoroughly always and forever good, and everything he does is for our good. I promise you, he said, that God does not lie awake nights trying to figure out ways to disappoint us or harm us or crush our dreams or our faith. Still, it might seem sometimes that that is exactly what's happening. The righteous do not always prosper, nor do the wicked always suffer. This is why we read the books of Job and Ecclesiastes along with the rest of the Bible. But it is a joyful and peace-giving moment when we finally recognize God acting for good in our lives, whatever happens to us. 
Thanks for that, Christian. It brings to mind the idea of redemptive suffering and about how that can sometimes be used to ask people to give more than they can or to last longer than they feel that they have physical strength. So in listening to Elder Holland's talk, I saw a few people talking online about how this idea of redemptive suffering isn't always healthy for us, that sometimes we can go longer than we should or maintain relationships longer than is healthy or things of that nature because we see it as being a part of the prospect of redemptive suffering. So how do we approach that as disciples who have so much on our plates and are asked to do so much for so many when we may not feel that we have enough to give to others? Yeah, I think this is the lovely sort of counterpoint to this notion that, that sometimes God is working with us through our trials and that then we take upon ourselves this idea and think in some ways we have to punish ourselves as a virtue, that, it's, that suffering is therefore inherently virtuous. I don't think that that's the case. I don't think that suffering is inherently virtuous. But I think that there are moments in which we have trials, in which a lot of burdens are placed upon us, and that God will then lighten those, or God will, will bless us in the moment, and that we, will, that we can come through those things. But I think we should never place ourselves in a situation of continual suffering, abusive relationships, for example, or in a, a workplace which is uh, particularly difficult, or these experiences uh, where we're constantly being confronted by those who have uh, caused abuse or pain, I think don't need to be perpetuated. But, the, but it is possible, I think, to find healing and to move away from those experiences. Thanks for sharing that. And it reminds me of a great article that former Institute fellow Deidre Green wrote that we will be sure to link to in the show notes, which you can sign up for at mi.byu.edu. And Christian, moving forward, I'm thinking about Joseph and Benjamin, and again, thinking about the Technicolor Dreamcoat here, that beautiful moment of reconciliation of Joseph recognizing that his brothers would be willing to sacrifice for Benjamin when they chose to sell him into slavery. Were there any sort of special feelings or things that we should know about this meeting of Joseph and Benjamin? Joseph seems determined to get Benjamin to Egypt. We, we hear, and it's an interesting aspect of biblical narrative, when Joseph is questioning his brothers right there in Genesis 42, the, the questions that he asks them are different than the ones that the brothers report. And when the brothers go back to see Jacob, what they say is, Joseph wanted to know about your father and about your brother. So Joseph's concerns are for Benjamin and for Jacob. He's also concerned about his dreams being fulfilled. And so he does want all of the brothers there, it seems, at that moment to bring about his dreams. But he really wants to see Benjamin, can sort of see this in this moment, this beautiful moment when Benjamin arrives. Do remember, these are the only two children of Rachel. Benjamin is born as, his, as their mother died in childbirth. He's the last surviving connection for Jacob between him and Joseph and Jacob and Joseph and Jacob and Rachel. But but he's Joseph's brother as well. And so there's all kinds of sort of special things going on between these two brothers. And this creates a really interesting and sort of poignant dramatic moment. Now, in the Syriac tradition, when Syriac scholars read and interpreted the Bible, one of the things that they loved to do was retell or dramatize particular scenes, particularly these poignant moments when, when there's a lot of tension in the narrative or, there, or you find a heightened dramatic moment. And they would use a genre that they adapted from, the, from ancient Near Eastern literature called the dispute or dialogue poem. This is a, a genre that was used in ancient Sumerian and still today in modern Arabic, in which two figures or two entities will argue about which one is the best in a dispute poem, or will dialogue with each other in a dialogue poem. And so biblical, other biblical examples include uh, the a dispute between Cain and Abel, dispute between Joseph and Potiphar's wife, a d dialogue between even uh, in New Testament stories between the angel that Jesus told would go to paradise and the angel standing to guard the way into paradise. And so these are wonderful moments which are given in church. These are, are liturgical uh, dramas that were performed and sort of sung uh, antiphonally. So you have to kind of two choirs and they would. And we have one of these for this moment where Joseph and Benjamin meet. 
and thought it would be nice to share this today. This text has just been edited and translated by Sebastian Brock, one of my teachers at Oxford, and he's given this lovely rendering. In the original Syriac, it has 22 verses arranged as an acrostic, so each verse begins with the first letter of the Syriac alphabet. And we have three parts. Uh, there's a narrator that Rachel has kindly agreed to play, uh, Joseph that Joseph will play, and I'll play Benjamin. And uh, we'll go through this, and you can hear how scripture was imagined in an ancient Syriac context. Oh, my friends, you have not seen two brothers sitting and talking to one another without the one knowing who the other was. I'm amazed, my boy. How saddened is your soul, and how grieved is your heart, and how your tears pour forth. I will reveal to you, O king, the great pain that I possess, that burns me without leaving me, the light of my eyes, Joseph. Wonder takes hold of me, amazement greatly astonishes me, at how you are weeping over one when you have ten other brothers. Listen to me at this word, my child, which I shall tell you. The ten other brothers that you have rejected Joseph. How should I reject Nissan's rose, Joseph? How should I forget the light of my eyes, Joseph? Trembling has fallen upon me, and fear and fright, on the one hand at you, my lord king, and on the other at my brothers. As the Lord God lives, and by the life of the king of Egypt, no evil will befall you, my boy. Reveal to me the truth. If I were to reveal to you the terrible news of Joseph, maybe you too, my lord king, would be weeping for Joseph. Whom did Joseph resemble, my boy? Reveal to me the truth. Maybe you'll be disclosing to me that his likeness has been seen by you among the slaves. Recount it to me rightly. Reveal the truth and tell me. Whom did Joseph resemble? My boy, reveal and explain it to me. Joseph has no resemblance either among kings or among slaves. There is one person to whom I would liken him, but I am afraid to tell you. My lord king, he resembles you, and his face is like your face. The scent that comes to me from you is like the scent of my brother Joseph. Weeping befell between them, and they began to embrace one another. They were asking each other all that had happened to them. What is the old man Jacob doing? My boy, reveal to me the truth. Ever since I departed from him, my boy, reveal to me and tell me. His eyes flow with tears. His white hairs are soiled with ashes. He has made sackcloth his clothing ever since he learned that you were dead, Joseph. His mouth solemnly swears by God without ceasing that he will never be comforted until he sees Joseph. When he is thirsty, it is his tears that he drinks. When he is hungry, it is ashes that he consumes. And he swears that I will not reject the light of my eyes, Joseph. Arise, my boy, and go and take my garments to the old man Jacob. Show him my likeness and tell him that Joseph is alive. He had breathed the scent of the dead, but now the old man Jacob said, It is the scent of a dead man who has come alive. My boy, reveal to me the truth. Praise be to God who brought Joseph to life for Jacob. And he told him about his youthfulness and about his return to him. Thanks be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and upon you, the audience. May his mercy continually be outpoured. Thanks to you both. That's really wonderful. Isn't this a, I, I find this to be a splendid example of this imaginative engagement with Scripture. And we can see all kinds of different aspects of the Joseph story being brought in as, as this uh, particular encounter between the two brothers at the moment of sort of recognition is dramatized. I also think there's a parallel to modern saints today thinking about church history and acting out particularly moving scenes from church history. But I think that we can also learn that it's appropriate to use imagination. Things don't have to be 100% historically verifiable for them to have meaning, for them to inspire us. And that's something that we can learn from these types of plays as well. Yeah, I think this goes along even with the idea of likening as Nephi uses it. One thing that I find very powerful in scriptures as a whole is that we take Isaiah to be scripture and we take Nephi's interpretation of Isaiah and its application to us as scripture just as much. I think that in being able to interpret scripture and actually say, this is what is powerful to me, and I'm actually going to play that up. I'm going to try and get as close to um, a sense of the divine as I can through a moment of such emotion and raw familial redemption even, to kind of play that 
for ancient people to be able to interpret it and not just personally, but have that be something that they had in a community, even maybe not theatrical, but written, published sense. That is really powerful to me. Same here. It also brings to me the idea that those in the audience hearing that poem wouldn't have identified with being an Egyptian viceroy who had risen from being a slave to being a very powerful person, but nevertheless would have recognized their lives in Joseph's life, but also in Benjamin's life and in Jacob's life and in the brothers' lives. And that brings into question for me in these chapters in Genesis, who is this story actually about? There's lots of characters, but who should we see as maybe the main this is a great question and something that I was really struck by as I was, as I was studying these chapters because as we said I grew up with Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat not the sons of Jacob but it seems pretty clear when you actually read Genesis very closely even Joseph's story is not about Joseph it has to be put into context in the entire book there is before Joseph no really clear cut good character and so we see even God, as we are given as a portrayal in Genesis, destroys all of humanity at one point. And all of these characters that we get are very complicated. And I mean, even Joseph, you'll often get interpretations where he has a bit of a pride problem. But even so, he's pretty universally a good guy. And that is made far more interesting by the idea that it's not about him at all. As we get Jacob at the beginning, the story of Jacob is intertwined throughout all of this. And he goes through a transformation in himself. He, after Joseph is dead, is said to have believed that all things were against him, which is kind of not something that we revere as a state of being in Christianity. To say that God is a little bit against you is against our idea of being a people of God. And Jacob will come and he gets this whole death scene. Joseph just dies at the end of Genesis 50, and there's no brava, no, no big part of that. So we can see him kind of being cut out of the story, even in his inheritance not being given to him, but to his two sons. Very fascinating for that to be centered on Jacob. Yeah, this is something that maybe it's fitting and fits into the narrative that Jacob, again, is choosing younger sons to continue on the blessings of Abraham, that one's posterity would be as numerous as uh, the stars in the sky, as it were. What I'm interested about, though, here too, is that Judah, meaning the tribe of Judah, also seems to be redeemed. We talked at length about Tamar last week and about how the tribe of Judah originates, but what do you see happening for the people of Judah in these last chapters of Genesis? We have to see Joseph as a type of Christ. There is so much kind of in there from being wrongly accused for immorality, being punished, being held in a dark prison of sorts, and then getting out of that to as a king to help save lives of others. In verse 8 of chapter 42, we read that Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. As a Christian audience or even an audience familiar with Christianity, we can't read that and not think about Jesus. But the story of Joseph is not so much about his journey there, but the redemption that it brings Judah, which is really interesting when you look at a parallel, brought me to think about whether the story of Jesus is even about his story of overcoming, right? Is it about the atonement or is it to us personalized as a, this is about my redemption? And that's just kind of, I mean, a tangent you can take for a really long time. But what we see in Genesis is that Judah gets all these like little inserts, right? We have the story of Tamar, and it seems to be paralleling a lot of King David, even Solomon at the time, that despite his sinful relationships in the family, he is still worthy of bearing a messianic line. Many scholars agree that the text is meant to assuage people under King David's rule, that he is meant to be leading them. The sins which Judah was presented as having parallel the sins that David committed, whether that be that he was the youngest child, which is a theme we see throughout Genesis as being the younger child gets the rule or the birthright or whatnot, his fraternal conflicts, which we also see throughout the book, his adultery with Bathsheba, hence the Tamar story, or just the general background of being a shepherd married to a certain Bathsheba and having a daughter or daughter-in-law named Tamar. It is the story of the past, but it fits in all these anticipations of 
the future. And so as we see Judah being the mediator for the brothers, Judah that makes Joseph weep, that is something where we can't ignore the prominence of Judah, that this is written kind of by his seed in order to defend their rule. And even Jacob, you know, blesses, you know, kind of gives these willy nilly blessings to all the tribes. And then Judah gets this nice, like, and you will be king upon king upon king. It's a, a very large redemption from not such a great state in the beginning. So what do you see in thinking about Judah's relationship to his brothers here? So Judah becomes the king upon king, as you say, but how does that relate to the rest of the family? Yeah. So throughout our Abrahamic story um, in the Old Testament, even before Abraham, right, we get to Cain and Abel, where Cain asks, am I my brother's keeper? And kind of the implied answer is, yes, you are supposed to be looking out for your brother. And brother may be in a larger sense, but here it is even familial. And we take a lot of importance, familial lines, even patriarchal lines of these families. So there is a clear importance in even the union to Israel that they have and the union to each other that they have. And Judah, along with the rest of the brothers, you know, had completely betrayed. That was not Joseph's keeper in any way, sense, or form by selling him into slavery. But finally, when Benjamin is asked to framed for thievery, Judah offers himself in place of Benjamin. And this is the first time we really see in the book of Genesis someone actually being their brother's keeper. I mean, even Joseph is trying to imprison his brothers, right? It is only Judah that is able to say, please, I am looking out for my brother. I think that's the perfect place to end this week. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast? And follow us on social media at, at BYU Maxwell on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu.edu. Thank you, and have a great week.